events can be a major problem. Federal funding for Washington will be distributed to organizations through the Washington DNR. 14 wildfire prevention programs will be funded throughout the state. Reporting in Pullman, I'm Lauren Patterson. The arts community in Tacoma is mourning the loss of Chandler O'Leary. 41-year-old O'Leary died suddenly on April 2nd following an acute case of pneumonia. Here she is speaking in an interview with the city of Tacoma back in 2013. Drawing and sketching is a really important part of my process. I have a sketchbook with me everywhere I go, um, at least one. There's one in my purse right now. And um, I try not to rely too heavily on photography, at least not at the beginning, uh, because when you're looking through a lens at life all the time, you kind of rely on that lens to do all the work for you. O'Leary also wrote a couple of travel books. She also painted 24 medallions at the Old Town Dock in Tacoma. This is KUOW. Support for NPR comes from NPR stations. Other contributors include Indeed, a hiring platform committed to helping businesses of all sizes. Businesses can invite candidates to apply, then schedule and conduct interviews in one place. Indeed.com slash NPR. Welcome to Friday. Welcome to KOW's Week in Review. I'm Bill Radke. Duplexes, fourplexes, sixplexes. We'll try to make this proposed state law less complex as if we can. We've got Seattle Channel host and producer Brian Callen on with us. Hi, Brian. Great to be here, Bill. Thanks. Seattle Times transportation reporter. Hi, David Croman. Hello. KUOW arts and culture reporter Mike Davis. Hey, Mike. Great to see you, Bill. Great to see you, too. <laughs> finally, uh, you can also stream the show, watch it happen on YouTube and Facebook. Just uh, look for us on um Let's see. Just search KOW Public Radio. That's how it happens. So let's get into it. A lot of a lot of statewide news, of course, with the legislator uh, session happening. It looks like more housing density is coming statewide. This week, the state Senate passed the so-called middle housing bill to allow duplexes, townhomes in neighborhoods that are now dominated by single family homes. KUOW's housing reporter Joshua McNichols told us where the density goes is still being negotiated. Ask Seattle City Council member Dan Strauss what he thinks of the state's middle housing bill, and he says it's a welcome change. Because the suburban communities around Seattle have left it to Seattle to bear the burden of the growth that the whole region needs to take. Now they're going to have to wrestle with that. But how much they'll have to wrestle with it depends. The House and Senate passed different versions of the bill. The House version requires suburbs like Mount Lake Terrace or Covington to allow up to six plexes, just like the big cities have to. The Senate version lets smaller cities off the hook with only duplexes. Now it's up to House and Senate leaders to work out a compromise. David, I'm starting with you because you told me you think this is the most important new law this session. Well, I, I or think, what did you say? Biggest deal? Something yeah, like that. Yeah, I mean, I, I think it. I think that's. I, I guess I don't want to be so definitive. Okay, about Brian, it because, I'm going to start with you. <laughs> no, but I, I will say. Yeah. I mean, it, I'm I, taking it away. No, no, no. I think. I think it is in some ways because um, you know we have talked about a housing crisis for a really long time, and um, you know it's getting harder and harder to deny that part of that is because there are just huge portions of the state and the cities where you cannot put new housing. And so the result is you see a lot of new housing kind of crammed into the areas that allow it. Oftentimes neighborhoods that were historically black or uh, maybe lower income. And, um, you, you know, and so what this bill does is it kind of opens up some of that development to, to happen in, um, you know, everywhere. Um, and it's, it's also no, notable because um, it, it just is a huge sea change. I mean, any, anybody who's been following Kind of local politics for the last decade you know i i think back to 2015 um seattle had proposed basically doing exactly this it wasn't a massive up zone or anything like that but it would have allowed for up to four plexes in most seattle neighborhoods and it got yeah, it was mayor ed um yeah murray ed murray thank you yeah i remember that it was it was brought up and then dropped well it was dropped because it was a couple months before an election and it just got such huge pushback um and, and in fact, I'd quibble a little bit with what Councilmember Strauss was saying about Seattle absorbing all the growth because Seattle hasn't really made changes either to absorb mm. a lot of that growth. And um, even Seattle has has shied away from this. And so to go from this being kind of an untouchable issue that uh, at least as even in 2015 was sort of seen by some as political suicide to um, it passing on a state level like this is um, pretty significant. 
Yeah, you actually had groups like the Association of Washington Cities, which was against this for many, many years, actually coming to the table and dealing with this. But I'm interested in another uh, kind of tweak on this, David, which I, I, I think is an important part of this because we have cities like Portland, just to the south of us, that has had this type of uh, allowance for the fourplexes, et cetera, on basically all parts of the city. And it hasn't been a situation where we've seen a, a boom of, of those fourplexes going in. It still has to pencil out for developers out there. And I think that's the other part of this that still has to drop in terms of, okay, how is this actually going to play out? Are we going to see, you know, all these things start to, all these new buildings start to come in? And I'm not quite sure about that. It's very expensive to get involved in the whole construction field right now. And I'm interested to see what this actually does in terms of creating more housing, because that's the bottom line. We need more. Well, in California, I mean, Washington follows uh, California and Oregon who, who did similar, passed similar laws. Right. In California, I think there was a study that came out a couple months ago that showed it didn't actually create, at least in the first year, has not actually created that much more housing. Um, in some ways, you know, the, the tough pill to swallow here is if, if Seattle had done that in 2015, you have to imagine that it would have spurred quite a bit of development because you know, anyone who's paid attention to the housing market in mm -hmm. Seattle between 2015 and basically 2021, 2022, it was ravenous and there was a ton of appetite for it. Now this is being passed at a time when interest rates are much, much higher. Yeah. Uh, there, you know, development projects are much harder to pencil out. And so uh, I, I think it's a big change in some ways, but I agree. I'm not, maybe it makes a big difference. I don't know though, for sure that it will. Well, you know, I also talked to Joshua McNichols, and since he's a reporter and not a genie, he couldn't give me that the answers that I was really <laughs> right. But I, I think that, you know, I agree with what I'm hearing. I think in Seattle, we could have done this already, and we chose not to. So that makes me think what's going to happen now, because it's not like there's a bunch of new land that's going to appear to be developed. Things are going to have to be redeveloped. So where are developers going to be able to get this land? Where's it going to come from? Who's selling? Who, right? So like there, there's all of these questions. The supply chain, I think, is also going to play a factor in the cost that it's going to take to do this. What I'm curious is what neighborhoods this is going to impact the most when I think about South Seattle or, and there's data that I don't have in front of me. I'm the arts guy here on the, uh -huh. on the <laughs> legislative deck. Yes, but, yes. I'm just thinking like where where are the highest concentration of renters mm -hmm. in the city? Because these seem like the places that are more likely to be redeveloped, because if I'm renting my house out to one family, if you tell me that I can now rent to four on the same property, mm -hmm. well, now I see dollar signs. But if I live in a neighborhood and I want my neighborhood to stay single family, I'm not incentivized to, to add extra units, right? Mm. If I live in a neighborhood and it's already hard to park, do mm. I want to do I want to do this to my neighborhood? Yeah. So I, I think that the city has to be careful about how this plays out, who's going to be impacted. And, and like usual, I'm thinking about South Seattle. And I think about that, too, because I think about South Seattle, maybe some of the older buildings, and they're actually all around the city there. Is it going to be a situation? Where is that tipping point where, OK, we're going to buy up this old property, tear it down and build something new? And is that new building there going to have units that are less affordable for people? So I think this brings up this whole idea of the naturally affordable housing that we have now, some of the new housing that could come in. How are those going to affect each other? Are we going to see new neighborhoods getting gentrified as if the South Side wasn't getting gentrified enough already? And, and, and what happens there? And I would add to that as well. You know, you can put a, a sixplex in if you're a quarter mile away from a major transit yep. station. So what's going to happen in Othello? What's going to happen in Rainier Beach? Like, these are areas that I'm thinking about that might look dramatically different than what they do now. I think yeah. the one sort of maybe, I don't know if it's a counterpoint or not, but that I think there's a ton of pressure already on those neighborhoods because neighborhoods like Magnolia or some of the richer uh, neighborhoods in, Nor in North Seattle, they haven't had to develop anything at all. And so if you think of, you know, you have thousands and thousands of people moving into Seattle um, right now, they, they, cannot move into those rich white neighborhoods in North Seattle because there's no new development. And so I think in some ways, maybe what that has done, because you can't add any more density in those neighborhoods, you do see neighborhoods like the Central District built up more already because that's allowed there right now. You can put more density there. Um, and, you know, if you look at maps of where density is currently allowed uh, on top of neighborhoods that were previously uh, redlined, 
it's almost a one-to-one -one correlation that the density is going right, right now a lot to neighborhoods that were previously redlined. And I think, so I think there are certainly um, concerns around uh, gentrification and, and, and all that. Uh, I think the neighborhoods probably that would see the most difference are areas that are actually losing population because, um, you know, kids move out and people get divorces and things like that. Um, I would think that in those neighborhoods, like, again, I keep saying Magnolia and Ballard to a certain extent, what we could see is people who are living, you know, couple or a single person living in a massive house that maybe used to have four people in it. Now, those people could have the option of developing that into a duplex. They can stay in their house. You can rent the second part of that house. Mm. And then that's a, that's a family that that or that's a renter that no longer is looking for property in the central district or looking for property in South Seattle. So I think that's perhaps the argument that could be made as to why in some ways this, this could be a net positive for um, preventing gentrification in some parts of the city. Oh, no, I was just gonna say no, that's a great point. And because I'm a reporter, I talked to Joshua. Right. And but what I learned is that even with everything that you just said, we're still not going to have enough housing yeah, for what we true. actually need. This yeah, is this not going to address the actual issue at hand. Interesting yeah. you raise that. I, yeah, I keep hearing this, the state needs a million new homes over the next two decades. Is that guaranteed growth? Like, couldn't people decide to move away or not move here because housing's ridiculously expensive or tech layoffs or smoky summers or Cascadia earthquakes? Do we know? How do we know how many people are coming here well, over 20 years? I, well, we've tested the, tested the theory of Perhaps if we don't put enough housing, people won't move here. Yeah. And that's why we are where we are right now, which is what happens is that the rich people can move here, you know. And yes, I'm not arguing for yeah. against the density. I'm just saying, how do we know how how much a, some, a place is going to grow over 20 years? I'm, I'm, and I'm, and we look back at the pandemic and I know that affected a lot of different statistics here. So I'm not quite sure what we're looking at here. But if you're looking at past records here and again, even during the pandemic, we had a lot of people moving uh, into this area here. So I think that as you see things change over the next 20 years, as you see things like light rail getting built out, different ways to connect within our mm -hmm. region here, I think you are going to see more people here. Is it going to be a million more homes needed? That's definitely a, a big no. number, and it's it's something that's pretty scary out there. But okay. I think bottom line, we're just not going to get to those housing numbers. It's a fun need. place to live, Bill. Yes, yeah, that's right. Crack and make the playoffs, Bill. <laughs> that's right. Seahawks surprised us last year, Bill. People that's right. Be here. Mariners too, baby. Mm -hmm. <laughs> they want to be here because of KOW. Let's be honest. Right. Um, okay. Let's move on because so much to talk about from Olympia. Just, well, just this. But this is this is a uh, Washington State meets the whole country. The uh, this morning, Friday morning, the White House asked the U.S. Supreme Court to preserve access to the abortion drug Mifepristone. You know, last week, a Texas appeals judge invalidated the FDA's approval of that drug. Then a Washington state judge, as well as Spokane federal judge, went the other way. He ruled in favor of Washington and 16 other blue states that sued to keep Mifepristone on the market. Brian, those are contradictory rulings. They are. And I think it's a big concern for me because you look at a judge, a judge making a decision about a scientific approval by the FDA. And we're talking about a drug that was approved 23 years ago. I think it raises a lot of different questions. I feel the FDA being pulled into this political fight, kicking and screaming here after a decision they made more than two decades ago. So I'm concerned about that part and what it really sets in terms of a precedent here with regard to a judge making a decision on a scientific uh, fact that was proven by the FDA and, and where that goes. So I think this is going to be a big battle. I'm glad the U.S. Supreme Court is coming in here. Where exactly are they going to rule after the Dobbs decision is anybody's guess. But uh, seeing a judge kind of step over these lines here, even some conservative voices out there have said, whoa, this is some pretty big news. Mike, you were saying Washington State argued that Nick Pristone is quite safe. Yeah, in fact, they argued that it was safer than Tylenol. Mm -hmm. And I mean, there's a 23 year history of this drug being used, being used safely. So the fact that we even found ourselves here, as Brian said, is actually scary. If you're telling me that a group of doctors could just come together and, and have a lawsuit and we could take a drug off the market, that's a, that's a scary thought, because what drug can be next? And meanwhile, Washington State has bought a three-year supply of right. this drug. Yeah, which is interestingly distributed by the Department of Corrections, I think, because mm -hmm. they have a pharmaceutical license. Right. Is, is that right? Um, yeah. Yeah. I'm, I, um, 
it will be interesting. I mean, there's there's not going to be any clarity on this until the Supreme Court weighs in because I haven't heard a good explanation yet for how these two rulings actually interact with each other. Um, and I don't know that there is a good one. I think this is, uh, in theory, why we have the Supreme Court. <laughs> yeah. Mike, you were asking good questions about we have the drug, but if it's not legal, if it ends up, what is that going to end up meaning for Washington? And I think that's kind of what David is saying as well. Like, what do we do if we have a three year supply, but then the Supreme Court says that it's illegal? Can we still distribute? Can people still use it? Do these right. things become crimes? And what are the rules here? Are states going to become more autonomous? Is that what we're going to see? We're going to say that in Washington, you could do this. I mean, there's just there's way more questions than answers. And the law should never be this interesting. But it is very interesting to, to watch all of this play out. Well, speaking of the law, Congress could change all of this. Congress could pass pass a law either allowing access to these drugs or denying access, depending on which way Congress goes. It's kind of stuck in the middle right now. It's so close. I, I feel like that's very close there. And I, I, I don't know if that's going to be on the table or not, but I, I think it's interesting with your point there, Mike, with regard to the states that are on board with this, the states that are not, you've got this ruling that was made uh, in Washington state here saying, okay, you can't alter what what's already the status quo for this drug here, but it's a ruling that only applied to the 17 states in Washington, D.C. Mm -hmm. that were involved in the lawsuit there. So it really does create a, a separation there between some states that are that are working with this and want to make sure this drug is just distributed and others who are not. So and, you know, will we see more people driving here for abortions? I know we've definitely talked about that over the past couple of months here. Will they be driving here for these drugs? I, I, I it's it's fascinating what this could turn into. And maybe that's the wrong word, but we really do need some sort of ruling here, which yeah, this, nope. we're waiting on the Supreme Court. Fascinating yeah. is, is I would say, the word, because this drug has been political for a while now, yeah. right? I mean, in 2011, they, they classified it as if it were an opioid. So you have this drug that is proven to be safe for use, but we're treating it like it's fentanyl. So I think that the, the politics have stepped into this a long time ago. I think it's all just coming to a head right now with these two lawsuits. Well, and this, this group that sued moved to Amarillo, Texas and set up their business specifically in this place because they knew that the, this judge friendly. Judge. Well, OK, so they have never they say that they had, you know, a, a doctor or somebody that they were representing in Texas when it's fairly clear they did this because they there was one federal judge in this area and he has written extensively um, being a, against abortion and they knew that they would get a favorable ruling and they're right. And so this kind of court shopping where you set up an LLC or whatever in the district that you want is, um, you know, I don't, I, I'm not so naive to think that there's like a ton of faith in the judicial system right now. Mm -hmm. But um, this, if, if you had that faith, this certainly would make you question it. If the Supreme Court, US Supreme Court takes this up, they could rule by early summer. We'll see. Mm -hmm. Another legislative development, when are police allowed to pursue a car? Mike, it looks like the state's going to restore some of the leeway police used to have to give chase. Yeah, they they changed the language in the law from probable cause to reasonable suspicion. Um, we, we can we can parse words here on reasonable suspicion, but it seems like if the cops think you did one of these crimes that's listed, they can now chase you again. Uh, this well, I do have some language <laughs> on that. Reasonable suspicion says the officer has an objective belief based on specific and articulable facts articulable okay. yeah, that's, a, that's a great <laughs> word that's a great word to put in the law brian you look like you're itching right now <laughs> no Go well ahead. i it's and i think i just think about the different things that officers can chase for and and when their judgment right. is is pulled into play which i think was a big part of this at least all the law enforcement agencies were saying we need to trust our officers and have them go out there so i think where this compromise actually came down was all right if there are violent offenses, if there are sex offenses, if there's a vehicular assault, some sort of escape from a penitentiary or something like that, domestic violence, DUI, okay, that needs to happen. Car theft, very interestingly, is not on there. And so I, I think that's a piece of the discussion, too, because some of these different agencies have said, well, guess what? Theft is way up, 88% in some cases, because these people are driving away and won't think they get caught. And I'm bringing both these pieces up because I think in 2021, when this was passed, there was a realization that when these chases start, a lot of times innocent bystanders and other people end up getting hurt or killed. And so they're trying to reduce that number. 
it unfortunately turned into a situation where oh, we can't do our jobs at all, which I don't think is entirely accurate. So I think what has happened here, I know that it's basically turned into one of those pieces of legislation where nobody's happy, which I think you almost want at the end of the day, because <laughs> some of the uh, lawmakers uh, out there have said, all right, this is a compromise. And uh, some of the law enforcement agencies have said, OK, there's a first step. So they didn't get all they wanted here. So we did bring it back to something that's a little bit different. I think it gives a little bit more power to officers. But I think those specific uh, uh, those specific uh, crimes out there that they're talking about their sex offenses, violent offenses helps helps leaven the bread a little bit on yes. this. And it is a compromise. Yeah, it is absolutely a compromise. And maybe in these times that we're living in, based on all the stuff we just talked about, <laughs> maybe we have to take a compromise and yeah. we can get one. Hmm. One other note, the Redmond police, do you know they have a GPS locator tag that they shoot out of the front hmm. of their car? It sticks to the suspect's car and tracks them without any need to chase them. It's, it's like Spider-Man. It's like a spider tracer. Yeah, it's the same technology as the spider tracer. Do you know, sure. do, has it been used? Do we have dash cam, you know, video? Does it how often does that thing stick to the car versus not stick to the car? How many yeah. if it doesn't if it fall? I've seen it. It looks unwieldy. It looks it surprised me. I thought it was going to be like a wad of gum or something. But it's, it's, big. it's as big. Yeah, I don't know how to describe it. It's clunky. And I don't know. I'm just very curious how if this is some kind of game changer or a real outlier. I don't know yet. I, I think we're still waiting on yeah. some of that technology there, but it's, it's an interesting uh, development. And I think Redmond is one of the cities that along with King County and Seattle has really reduced its amount of chases already. And so this is, I think, just an effort to try to bring it to a statewide level so that all agencies are trying to do the same thing. Mm -hmm. All right. So the House and Senate still have to work out their differences on that. Before we take a break, since we're talking about uh, traffic and driving and safety now, David, transportation reporter, David Croman. <laughs> Lawmakers had a bunch of ideas about traffic safety and didn't end up doing much. Yeah, they had a whole press conference at the beginning of the session with um, lots of people up there, including the governor talking about, I mean, because 2022 was the deadliest year since, I think, 1990. Of course, we have a bigger population, but still, that's not a good, that's that's a, not a good state of affairs. Um, and so there was a lot of setup around this being the session when they were going to make some pretty big changes, namely... The biggest one was probably lowering the blood alcohol limit from 0.08% to 0.05% as Utah did. Uh, they had talked about banning right turns on red toward, you know, in most places. Uh, they had talked about kind of requiring and funding driver's ed for more drivers. Um, to that only half of one of those really happened. You know, the, the blood alcohol limit is dead. The right turn on red is dead. The driver's ed bill is moving forward, but it's kind of been, uh, amended down to become a, a plan for a plan type thing. Um, so, you know, if you talk to legislators about this, they say, you know, these are big policy shifts. They require a change in how we live. People are used to turning right on red. People are used to having a beer and then driving, um, you know, and so therefore it was almost always going to take more than one session to get these things done that, uh, you know, they would try this year and then maybe try again next year and maybe even the year after that. Um, but at the same time, you know, you're talking about a pretty urgent issue of 750 or so people who died last year on the roads. Um, you know, there, there, there were some bills that were passed that you can now put cameras in work zones. Um, there's an incentive to hire new state patrol officers for, in theory, more enforcement. So there's not nothing. But uh, as far as what was initially uh, sold at the beginning of the session and what has actually passed now, it's um, quite whittled down. Not to say that they haven't been busy, but it just didn't no, seem yeah. like a transportation rose to the fore for some reason. And I, I know the city of Seattle's working on that, too, with its Vision Zero project and trying to make sure we have zero deaths, fatalities by the year 2030. And I'm interested to see what happens with these with what did not happen, I guess, at the yeah. state level and how that impacts what the city tries to do. Is it going to really try to put in more of these no right turn on red situations? Is it going to be changing more of its uh, city blocks such that the pedestrian kind of has the, a head start on cars, et cetera? I, mm -hmm. I, I wonder about that. I, I feel like Seattle is going to be pushing for a little bit more of that, even though the state maybe didn't as much. Yeah. And I think you're right. I mean, you see this in legislative sessions that there becomes a sort of prevail, a, a priority rises to the top. And a lot of things underneath that tend to suffer because you only have so many committee meetings and you have only have so much time to whip votes. And um, there are these cutoffs when you have to get bills out of their committee. And if you don't hit that, those bills die. And so, 
you know, I just think that um, between inflation and housing bills and, uh, you know, a lot of other priorities, I just think that the, the traffic safety legislation, it just didn't, didn't quite get there this year. So, Mike, you can still turn right on red for now. I know this is <laughs> precious to you. No, that was only that was the only thing I was listening for. Can <laughs> I still make my right? I love pedestrian head starts. I'm all I'm all uh, for that. But please don't don't take away my my right to make a right. Okay, here we go. Oh, okay. There's your slogan. Mm -hmm. There's your campaign ad. OK, <laughs> so we've got the Seattle Times transportation reporter David Croman, and that was KOW arts and culture reporter Mike Davis and Seattle Channel host and producer Brian Callanan. We're all on YouTube and Facebook streaming the show. I'm Bill Radke. It's KUOW's Week in Review, and we're not done catching you up on what happened over the week. Let's take a short break and stay right where you are. We'll be back soon. It's 48 degrees in Seattle. Forecast says it'll be mostly sunny this afternoon with a high of at least 56. It's 1231. This is 94.9 KUOW Seattle. All day long, we're looking for stuff. Where are my keys? Where did I save that file? What happened to my Orca card? After another busy day of searching, let us bring some things to you for a change. Join me, Kim Malcolm and All Things Considered, as we bring you unexpected and fascinating stories, in-depth science and arts reporting, and news you can trust. Listen to All Things Considered every weekday afternoon on KUOW, starting at 3. Support for KUOW comes from Maxwell Graham, personal injury attorneys providing dedicated advocacy for clients who may have experienced negligence, assisting other attorneys with complex litigation. More information at maxwellgraham.com. Welcome back to KUOW's Week in Review in Olympia. Continuing with our phrase in Olympia, both the House and Senate passed a bill banning semi-automatic guns like AR-15s that lawmakers call assault weapons. KUOW reporter Casey Martin told us this is about banning the sale, transfer, distribution, manufacture and importation of these guns, not taking guns away from current owners. It wouldn't apply to existing weapons in the state, only future purchases. But Dave Workman is skeptical. He's with the gun rights group, the Second Amendment Foundation. This is just the first step. Sure, they're going to be allowed to keep these firearms now, but say two years from now, they worry they're going to come back and ask for more restrictions. Workman says groups like his will be ready to sue the state if the ban becomes law. Just over the horizon, waiting, waiting in the tall grass are all the gun rights organizations probably preparing to take this issue to court. Preparing to take it to court, but Seattle Channel's Brian Callanan, hasn't this kind of ban been upheld in other states? It has. I think what's a little bit different now is a ruling by the Supreme Court last year. There's the Bruin decision, B-R-U-E-N. New York. There, yeah, that New York law that basically mm -hmm. said, OK, uh, we need to restrict people carrying guns outside their homes. The U.S. Supreme Court threw that out. So I think there's a lot of question about that now in that Bruin decision. There is some nuance, and I think both sides think they have a very good case here, but I, I think that's the big question right now. How does a new Supreme Court basically, uh, how, 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 what, what impact is that going to have on any case that goes forward here when it comes to the right to bear arms, which is uh, guaranteed by the Second Amendment? It's even <clears throat> stronger in our state when you look at the amendment. Uh, when you look at our state constitution, it says this is for self-defense, and there's a very clear case about that. So I'm interested to see where these challenges come from, but I think it's going to really stem back to that Bruin decision by the U.S. Supreme Court, and, and that's going to be something we need to watch here because definitely we will see these groups like the Second Amendment Foundation come out of the woodworks and start these legal cases when this passes, and I do believe that it will pass. Yeah, Governor Inslee is going to sign. There's no oh, not, sure. no question about that. Right? Yeah, yeah, and uh, Attorney General Bob Ferguson has been pushing for this for a while, um, just hasn't hasn't quite found the traction um, but yeah, again, you know, not always a rhyme or reason why these things get traction one year and not the other, but this year seems to be the year. And I, I did want to just tag on bill. There's a couple of other gun bills that are floating around out there. This is 1143. The house bill there requires gun buyers to show proof they have taken safety training and imposes a 10 day waiting period on purchases. 
The Senate approved that and that has passed the House. There's another one that might need a little bit more work to get it to the finish line, but this would allow the state attorney general or private citizens to actually sue gun, gun manufacturers or dealers if they negligent, negligent, excuse me, negligently allow their guns to be sold to minors or straw purchases, things like that. These are really big situations here with this legal case because the Sandy Hook parents not too long ago were able to successfully sue against Remington to the tune of $73 million. So I think we're starting to see some of this legislation start to happen at the state level because it's definitely not happening at the federal level. All right. Well, opponents of this uh, ban argued that there's a difference between a weapon of war and a modern sporting rifle, just because you can accessorize a gun to lessen the sound or the flash doesn't mean it's designed for murder. They uh, have lost that argument for now in Washington state with this uh, AR-15 type ban passing, and we expect the governor to sign that. Next up on the legislative uh, docket here, the lawmakers have been arguing over how serious a crime drug possession should be, and it looks like the legislature has decided it's either a simple misdemeanor or a gross misdemeanor. This one's going to come down to the wire here, and I've been following this pretty closely. This is uh, dating back to the Blake decision. You hear a lot about this because a couple of years ago, our state Supreme Court said, hey, look, the law that we have for simple drug possession in our state, it's not constitutional. You got to do something, legislature. So what's been happening over the past couple of months? You can't bust here, somebody just for having a drug on their, in their possession. They haven't necessarily done anything wrong. Correct. It was a situation where uh, Shannon Blake borrowed a pair of jeans and I had these drugs in here. I actually didn't know that my I borrowed this pair of jeans. Anyway, it was a bit yeah. of a convoluted story. But mm -hmm. what we're talking about is just the constitutionality of that of that bill. Mm -hmm. And so lawmakers have been working on this. The whole idea with the misdemeanor uh, was to make it something where, where they'd really be urging more treatment in cases like this. The gross misdemeanor was something that a few more lawmakers were on board with because they were saying, all right, we need to put a little bit more of a stick and a little bit less of a carrot here to try to make sure that people are first getting the treatment they need and actually taking care of the situation where drug possession uh, can be such a problem in Washington state. So I, I'm interested to, to see how this goes because the House in a little bit, in a little way, uh, watered down the version the Senate passed. The Senate said, let's do the gross misdemeanor. The House has said, no, nah, we really want to do misdemeanor. So I think this is going to be a fight to the finish. And the session ends on July, or excuse me, the session ends on April 23rd. But more importantly, in terms of what the Supreme Court has done, these new quasi rules that have been put in place by the state legislature a couple of years ago to deal with the Supreme Court ruling, those actually end on July 30th. And so they April. have. Yeah. So they have to make sure that they do something this session. I'm really interested to see this last week. What's going to hash out with this? Mm -hmm. And if it's just drug possession, not a charge of selling a drug, then the defendant can opt for a pretrial diversion program. Is that about it? Yep. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I think there's where, where you see agreement around this is um, there is. And I mean, it's probably a contrast to the, the 90s for sure. I mean, there is agreement that. Um, the treatment is a good thing that, uh, the, you know, incarceration or, uh, criminal justice alone is not, uh, you know, isn't gonna, isn't gonna fix the problem. And we see that we hear that from both sides of the aisle. There's a pretty broad agreement around that where there's disagreement is whether or not the criminal justice system makes sense as an entry point into that treatment. Uh, and the argument for misdemeanor or gross misdemeanor is yes, that, um, by having, some sort of statute that allows uh, police or courts to get involved and they're therefore sort of passed down some kind of mandate for treatment that that's a good thing. You know, I think, uh, you know, the, the more progressive left legislators, um, you know, both in the state level, but local levels too, are, are maybe a little more skeptical of that, um, less sure that that works. But when you look at what's what's happening in Olympia, the the argument that is winning is that uh, it is important and necessary to have some sort of involvement from, in this case, cops and courts to get people into treatment. Speaking of debating the wisdom of a criminal punishment, also in Olympia this week, the legislature finally repealed the death penalty, which has been, you know, our state Supreme Court invalidated the death penalty five years ago. Um, and they invalidated the way it was being used. They said the death penalty was being imposed in an arbitrary and racially biased manner. So the legislature 
could have responded by fixing the law, but they didn't. So now it, it's it's withered. They're getting rid of it officially now. It's been it's been gone, right? Yeah, it's it's more formalizing what what's already been in place for yeah. the past five years because the state supreme court made that ruling just about five years ago, and so now it's just a permanent repeal coming from the legislature. So I, I think a lot of people, at least in the Seattle area, I've, I've talked with uh, Jamie Peterson before, our senator, about this. He's been quoted as saying this was a, a moral statement that the legislature was making here. Now, I know there was definitely some some pushback uh, from some different lawmakers who wanted that fix that you're talking about. There, How Bill. would that have been fixed? Do you I, know? I, I, I know there wasn't question. the political will to do it. I mean, that, that just wasn't there. So oh, I don't know how they would have ensured that it would not be arbitrary and racially biased. I'm not saying it couldn't have been done. I just I, I don't I haven't reported on that. Followed mm-hmm. that. Yeah. OK, um, I noticed that the uh, there's a Spokane Republican whose sister was a victim of the Green River killer and said uh, she thinks he only told police about a lot of his victims because he didn't want to be executed. You know, she was arguing for the the uh, a use um, a sort of leverage um, effect of this. But again, that argument failed and the death penalty is going away. No question. The governor's signing that. Right. Yeah. Mm-hmm. OK, before we take a break, one more um One more note here, statewide note, you may never see another advisory vote on your ballot. Those are the these items that ask you for your opinion on taxes, but your opinion doesn't change anything. KOW reporter Paige Browning told us that Democrats passed a bill to replace advisory votes with a website educating voters about state spending and budgets. Democratic State Representative Amy Wallen testified Friday that advisory votes can sometimes take up more than a dozen pages on a ballot. It's time to modernize our ballots. This bill will provide that objective information easily available to the voters with a simple QR code or website in all kinds of languages. Initiative promoter Tim Iman supported the advisory vote law and says its repeal is maddening and infuriating. Not just maddening. Maddening and infuriating. Infuriating. Yeah, I'm it's so mad that I can't say that word. I'm livid right now. <laughs> can't can't uh, control Bill when he's like this. No, <laughs> I'm, I'm I'm upset. You can hear it, um, Mike Davis. Uh, what's the what do you think the motivation is here? Just just that we're we need to modernize our ballots, or we just don't want to talk about taxes on our ballots. I'm feeling a little maddened here too, yeah. Bill, because. I know how I feel, but I don't like who my allies are in this case. Okay. I think I I don't have an issue with making voters read. I don't care if it was 12 pages or 22 pages. You're you're voting. Read. I like don't don't be so American that you you just what you got no time on your hands. Like you need this Uh on your iPhone. No, (laughs) I like having a record of what we as voters want. Maybe it doesn't matter at all. But if you're a politician and you say you want to raise this tax and you put that on there and we advise you not to and you do it anyway. Now there's a record that you didn't listen to us. Mm -hmm. So that that is something. Don't send me to some website as you're just raising taxes whenever you want to. That's ridiculous. I I guess I just look at this. The advisory votes have no legal effect just to offer a counterpoint here, Mike. So no legal effect with these votes other than to say to lawmakers, we don't like taxes. And I just don't know anybody. If you walk up to them and say, hey, do you want a new tax? Are they going to say, sure, that sounds awesome. I mean, I think when it's on the ballot there, I, I think you'll find a lot of people are like, no, I don't want another tax. You know, do do what you got to do with the money you have. Now, when you look more into the issues and you say, OK, this tax is going to pay for X, Y, Z, et cetera, I think people can can learn more about it. But I, I guess I just have an issue with but doesn't, this one. Doesn't the ballot spell out what the tax is for? It does. It does. But again, what we're talking about here with this vote is something that won't be anything other than a, a vote after it happened, yeah. you know, and, and that's the part that infuriates me. You think that that voters are actually having a voice in it. And while they might be sounding off their opinion, that vote, in my in my view, kind of gets diluted a little bit. It's like I voted on this and nothing's happening other than I'm getting mad at my lawmaker. I don't know. Yes. Yes, Brian. Okay, exactly. Okay, okay. Let me let me get mad at my lawmaker okay. because the next time I see their name on my ballot, I get to remember, oh, this is the person that that just does whatever they want. They don't care oh. about what we say. OK, like there's the argument against it. I just don't really understand. You're, you're taking it away mm. for what? Yeah. 
be, to make it to to have less pages in my voting pamphlet for 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 what? Oh, now we're saving trees. Like, right. what are we what are we doing right now? I, I I just think it's a little confusing when you vote yes on something and other than telling the lawmakers you don't like it or you do like it or whatever else. You know what I'm saying? It just doesn't have a you're you're an right. Impact. You you are absolutely right. But I I to counter that I would say sometimes people don't realize that these things are happening yep. until they're in front of their face. You're right. This with with these with these right wingers are saying right now is that now it's not going to be in front of your face. Now taxes are just going to be raised. And if you don't happen to be paying attention, if you don't happen to log on to their website, you'll have no idea. No, yeah. tell me, let me know. Even if I can't do anything about it, let me know what you're going to do. Yeah. I think the two of them have got it handled. Why am I so passionate? I don't know why I'm so passionate about <laughs> no, it's, it's, Bill, can we talk about art? <laughs> yes. <laughs> yes. Can, can, do, do we have a break in us? Uh, before oh, yeah. we talk about art, deep breath, maybe a quick break, a sip of water, okay. a sip of water. <laughs> yeah, because I'm so infuriated by <laughs> and, and maddenated. Um, okay, well, just before we we end that, I think the uh, the other argument is that it could alienate people from the democratic process if they read something, maybe you've already summed this up, but they not only not only are they uh, it's not even a can you call it a vote if it has no effect it's an and then, advisory vote it, yeah, it, advisory vote okay yeah i guess you can um but also that if you if it's long and it has no effect it could dissuade some people from voting theoretically like eh, it's, getting to the it's, gob ballot, it's gobbledygook yeah. yeah if they don't get exactly maybe they don't get down to the part where they actually do need to fill in the bubbles and and make stuff happen is that it i guess i mean that's that's one way to look at it but <laughs> yeah. on, but on uh, on on your side, Mike, taxes tax increases are inherently dull. It's kind of hard to follow any all the laws anyway, right? We're just busy people. But the incremental marginal taxation rate on the lease of the <laughs> property for the up to the first thirty six months it's kind of not so everybody is going to know that it's gone it's through dull. it's yeah. dull. voting. If yeah. we're going to be honest, fair enough, but it's we're important. doing it because it's our civic duty. We're doing it because we have to okay. be a good citizen and <laughs> read your packet yeah, <laughs> like, don't... And, 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 or get involved before it comes to the point of an that's advisory true. vote. I think that's, that's a bottom fair. line for fair me. Enough. I think that's fair. It's, it's tough to get informed. You're right, but it, it needs to happen. That, Does anybody want? Fair. Thank you. It, it's Thank hard you. though, Brian, when our when our sports teams keep winning. Oh mm -hmm. man, distracted. It, it is distracting. <laughs> we got a lot going on. Man. Well, the Mariners have gotten less distracting than they were on opening night. <laughs> give, them, that's give, them time. give them time. The, the here's here's an example of the, the. I think this was on the last ballot. The legislature imposed without a vote of the people premiums on transportation network companies to provide workers' compensation to their drivers, costing an indeterminate amount in its first ten years for government spending. Yeah. <laughs> It's, I mean, yeah, it's there's a lot. There's one sentence. It's pretty weighted. It's yeah. pretty, uh, you know, gripping. All right, does that make you want to go deeper on that? No, but it, it makes me mad because they did that without asking. Me. That's all I heard. Well, they did. Ask. I, I mean, think they asked. They were at least well, elected, you voted for elected representatives. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> right. Okay. I mean, the argument, you know, one another argument I've heard in favor of it, though, is that uh, aside from the particulars of the advisory vote showing up on the ballot, it was it, they exist because there was an initiative that was run by Tim Iman that put them on the ballot. And so the argument is, okay, so are we gonna just have legislators, every time there's an initiative that passes, are they gonna just go to the next session and repeal that initiative because they don't happen to like it? So that's sort of an, another argument I've heard um, against repealing these advisory votes, which is less about, are the advisory votes good or bad, but more about the process of, you know, good or bad, voters put them there and here are the legislators, you know, taking them off. Um, I would say in the, my basic thought on this is uh, when we're talking about police pursuit bills and missing middle. And um, I think we're not going to be talking about advisory votes after this year no, ever again. No, we yeah, <laughs> we, we absolutely. Right, yeah. Right. OK, let's take a break. Can we take a break for art? OK, then we're going to be right back and talk about film and shampoo. Stay tuned. <laughs> Support for KUOW comes from the UW's Population Health Initiative, created to address the intersecting factors that impact well-being, such as poverty, access to health care, and systemic inequities, working to transform research into action. UW.edu slash population health. 
I'm Julian Marshall, host of BBC NewsHour. On today's programme, the court appearance in the United States of a young man accused of the biggest leak of secret government documents in a decade. And we speak to former Israeli Prime Minister Naftali Bennett about a moment of extreme peril for his country. BBC NewsHour is just 10 minutes away on 94.9 KUOW Seattle. Support for KUOW comes from the Metropolitan Improvement District in partnership with the Downtown Seattle Association. Property owners within the Metropolitan Improvement District are focused on keeping downtown Seattle clean, safe, and welcoming seven days a week. Learn more at downtownseattle.org slash mid. Welcome back to KUOW's Week in Review. I'm your host, Bill Radke, with Seattle Times transportation reporter David Croman, Seattle Channel host and producer Brian Callanan, KUOW arts and culture reporter Mike Davis. Seattle has its first film commission to attract more movie and TV projects. How is it going to do that? Well, it's going to do it by opening our city up to actually allowing films that are set in Seattle to be shot in Seattle. And they're, they're going to do this by getting people who are in the industry, who work in the industry, to be able to advise the city on what policies are needed to be in place to allow this to happen. And the ball's been rolling. They, they've been doing this. Um, Sarah Nelson is trying. If you let her tell it, this is, this is going to boost the creative economy. Like she's talking about jobs. These are films that should be here. If you want to use Seattle as the setting of your movie, why not open it up so that people in our industry can get on board and, most people that I talk to actually really like this. People in the film festival scene, people that we have so many creatives in Seattle that are here that want to be able to take part in these Hollywood productions. And this film commission is supposed to be a step towards that. And it's a, it's a part of, I think, a, a regional effort here because the county started up this creative economy statewide. initiative. Yeah, and yes, statewide, too. Statewide. I'm, I'm getting there. So the, the county did this creative economy initiative a couple of years ago, making a lot of investments, including this new film production studio out at Harbor Island, which yes. is pretty cool. They can yes. make an entire movie there, which is something we haven't had before. And then the state's kicking in some extra dollars, too. So this is the business and occupation tax uh, credit limit for the motion picture competitiveness competitiveness program, which is important. So this is something where basically the film production companies that are here, it used to be, okay, you can get some tax credits for doing your movie here. That used to be at the $3.5 million level. Now it's up at $15 million. Absolutely. So the states put some more money into this with the idea of attracting these different companies to do their work here. I mean, how embarrassing is it to say, oh, look, Grace Anatomy, it's set in Seattle. It's like, no, it's not. Maybe got a couple of shots, the Space Needle or something like that, but this is all in Vancouver. You know what I'm saying? Oh, so I, right. I, it, it's interesting to see city and state and county trying to work together here. I really do hope it works out because, like I say, when, when we see these things that are set in Seattle and they're not here, it, it's it's just not right. Well, wasn't there news recently that the second season of The Last of Us is all is gonna, there's going to be a lot that takes place in like a, a post-apocalyptic Seattle and it's all going to be filmed in Vancouver. Yeah. <laughs> yes. yes. Right. And, and that the statewide money that you mentioned is actually a big reason for yeah. that. And uh, if you go state to state, Washington was in the bottom three yep. on that incentive until they boosted it. So that should also help attract these big budget productions to come in and actually film here. Now, yeah. I, I have to do a disclosure here because I am the vice president of the National Association of People who go to a movie and don't mind whether it was filmed in a different location oh. from <laughs> what the plot would indicate. Mm -hmm. It's oh, an yeah, unwieldy right. title. We're yeah. still working yeah. on the title of the association. Yeah. But the acronym. I totally the disagree. <laughs> I totally disagree. It's so fun that they watched that movie um, Kimmy that was actually yeah. shot oh, yeah. here. Yeah. I'm not a film creator. I thought it was a terrible movie, but <laughs> it was very fun to see it. You know, she was down in Inner Bay and then she was on the light rail and she was in Pioneer Square. And it was so much more enjoyable to watch actual scenes of Seattle uh, rather than just, yeah, that one Space Needle flyover. Right. And then everything else. just. And shot. We, we care about art in Seattle, Bill. Yes. Like, that's that's, that's what matters. Yes. Like the, the creative economy in Seattle matters. And we have creatives here. We want to keep them here. This will help keep them here. They need work. Yeah. Yes, I am not affiliated you with against the, jobs. No, Bill? listen, I, I'm making clear I'm not affiliated with the Association of People who don't want creatives to be able to find work in their city. That's not my organization. It's a separate organization. A pack a cack, I think. Yeah. Yes. That's yes. <laughs> I'm just talking about the film goer 
experience. Yeah. But, but yeah. that's me. Okay. No, well, yeah. Who, I, I was going to say there is a King County report that showed a lot of people who are creatives in this area are really considering leaving just because the price of staying here is so much. And so anything they can do to incentivize people to stay here, that's a big deal. So I'm, I'm glad Absolutely. to see this thing come online and I hopeful we can see some more projects here. Yes. They announced the commission. I'm doing a story next week. So we're a little ahead of it, but okay. <laughs> yes, yes. Tune into KUOW next <laughs> week and you'll find out a little bit more about everything that's happening with the Seattle Film Commission. Very good. Okay. Um, more creativity in Seattle would make me smile as does the final section of this show. We always reserve something to smile about. I would offer this, the state legislature, back to that, passed a bill requiring hotels to phase out those little shampoo bottles. Those things are very hard to recycle. They fall through the filters at recycling plants and therefore end up being landfilled. So hotels are, have you seen them switching to the giant dispensers attached to the side of the shower? Those hotels, many of them argued against this bill, saying their customers like taking home those little bottles in their suitcases. And I am, as always, not taking a position on this legislation. What made me smile is this awareness of plastic waste prompted my family to buy bars of shampoo with no bottles. Have you used the bars shampoo? shampoo. Yeah, it's a shampoo bar. It sits in your sh shower. My, why are you shaking your head? I haven't even told you about the lather. You just, you <laughs> Tell us your, about the lather. You yeah. get your hair wet and you just rub like a so like soap. You just rub the shampoo bar and it lathers up. It's fantastic. This message brought to you by the Association of Shampoo no, Bar. Yeah. Although, using, yeah. If they're offering me uh, money, I would consider being a spokesperson, <laughs> I but it. I am not a spokesperson. If you don't like waste, it will delight you that you are buying and tossing that much less useless, unhealthy crap. What, a, what's a the bar problem? of shampoo? That's yes. what you're telling us right now. That's what right. I'm telling you. <laughs> In fact, why, why not? What else could be done without the bottle? Like yeah. deodorant bars would <laughs> cause an extra mess. What are Granted, we doing? Oh, come on. Listen, We're we jumping doing? off the rails. Okay. Yeah. No, I'm not. I'm saying deodorant bars too messy, but anything you already have to rinse off shaving cream bars, lotion bars. You're already putting lotion on your hands and rubbing Hygiene it into your skin. is not the corner that we cut to save the world. <laughs> That's not the corner that we can. There has to be something else that we can do to save the environment. <laughs> All right. I was going to pitch Coca-Cola in a bar ah, and you just dissolve oh, it in your mouth, but I'm not. It. No, forget, forget it. it. Yeah. Forget it. You I'm not even going to suggest right. it. All right. What, What's better? What do you have to smile about? I, I was thinking about some of the other stuff that's happening at the state level. We have a new state dinosaur that's about to be oh. put out there. This is a big deal. So these are the kids down at Elmhurst Elementary down in Pierce County. They brought this up four years ago. They've We're been proposing this since 100 million BC. Yeah, right, right. You would think it, it's, it, it didn't take that long, just four years. Okay. But this is a group and Representative Morgan from down in Parkland finally got it across the finish line. So soon we're going to have a Sushasaurus Rex. And this was the wow. first dinosaur found in Washington State, a fossil found in Washington State out at Susha Island State Park up in the San Juans. Really cool stuff to have a dinosaur named after us. So I'm just going to big give a big roar to uh, yeah. uh, Elmhurst Elementary. Nice well, work. What is the, the Rex means king. Yeah. Tyrannosaurus Rex means king of the tyrant lizards. Tyrant lizards so yeah. Sushasaurus Rex means king. King of the lizards found in Susha Island State I, Park. I believe, and well, you wouldn't want to mess with one either. I mean, oh, it's okay. maybe a little bit smaller than a T Rex, okay. and everybody's got their favorite theropod. But th this one's this well, one's way up there. Well put. put. Yeah, everybody has a theropod. Okay, yeah, any right. other smiles? I got one. I mean, we've been talking about legislation this whole show. Somehow we missed this legislation that opens the door for cultural committees in cities and counties throughout Washington. I know it's given, it's a given in Seattle. We got the Arts Commission and you know, the county does their thing. But now outside of Seattle, everyone gets to have one. So hopefully we'll see more arts statewide. Love it. That's mm -hmm. smile worthy. Anything, David, before we go, or are you going to punt? Uh, well, I enjoyed watching the, there was a Jared Kelnick hit a 482 foot home run, I which know. is the longest home run the, any Mariner has ever hit. Was uh, it windy? Was the wind blowing out? Yeah, of but, the stadium? Yeah, but that gives you you know, 10 or 15 feet. Okay. Uh, Seattle Times transportation reporter and designated hitter, David Croman. We have <laughs> I could do better, I think, than what the Mariners <laughs> yeah. are doing. <laughs> Ouch. Uh, Seattle Channel host and producer, Brian Callen and KOW arts and culture reporter, Mike Davis. Thanks so much for being Week in Review. 
Thank you. Thanks, Bill. Thank and you. Thank you to our producer, Kevin Kinestad, and to Juan Pablo Chiquiza and, Tio, Chiquiza and Tio Popescu and Bernard Ouellette, who runs the board. And I look forward to talking with you again in a week on Week in Review. Every Friday at noon, you hear Week in Review on KUO 